Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Ms. Wood. Let me, let's start at the beginning, I suppose. Um, OK, let's do it. You went to school here in the UK before going off to Yale for your undergraduate degree. Um, when, across this period, did you realise that you wanted to be a journalist? So my trajectory was a slightly unusual one in that I did not have any idea that I wanted to be a journalist growing up. I actually thought I wanted to be an actress when I was younger. And I went to Yale, I studied comparative literature, and then the second day of my fall semester of my senior year, 9-11 happened. And it is really crazy that I'm sitting in a room with you and like very few of you were even alive or born when 9-11 happened. But it was a cataclysmic event that fundamentally changed the lives of many people uh, around the world. But for a lot of Americans, I think it was a moment of feeling a calling. What can I do? How can I respond to this moment? What's my role? How did I not understand what was happening in the world? Why was I so ignorant? And for me personally, what struck me was this idea of a fundamental misunderstanding and miscommunication that has essentially resulted in this event. And so I became really fixated on the idea of wanting to go to these places and understand how this had happened and who was responsible and how they saw America and also try to understand how America saw itself versus how the rest of the world saw America and essentially act as some kind of a translator between different worlds. I was 22 um, and I was a senior at Yale, so I was full of you know, hubris and um, a lot of idealism, which has subsequently been kicked out of me. But um, at that stage, that was the idea. I didn't really know how I was going to go about it, but I did know in my bones on some level that this was what I felt I was meant to do. And I also understood on a fundamental level that I wanted to be at the tip of the spear, although I didn't know exactly where that would take me or what that would entail or what that even meant, honestly, because I had no frame of reference for it really in my life. No one in my family had ever done this job. I didn't have any friends who did this job. And so that's how it started. So without that frame of reference, then how did you go from Yale to Fox News then a year or two? Well, so what started, first of all, I went to Moscow to do an internship with CNN. And CNN was always my first choice. I was very fixated on CNN because I had been watching it religiously day and night after um, the Twin Towers attack. And so I went to Moscow. I had been studying Russian in my senior year, and I was also studying Russian literature. And I did three months there. And it was this sort of electrifying moment where you realize, OK, I am so far away from being able to achieve my dream, but I can see what it is now. And that's a really exciting thing to, to sort of at least lock your sights on that. And so I was just making tea and printing out scripts for people and making phone calls in bad Russian, which were probably not terribly helpful. But anything I could do to sort of insert myself into the situation, I was willing to do. Then I went to New York afterwards and because I wanted to get experience in a newsroom, which is very different than being in a satellite bureau. And CNN told me, I was 23 years old, and CNN told me, we don't have a full-time job for you right now. You'll have to wait three or four months. But there is something for you, but you have to wait three or four months. And I was like, oh my god, in three or four months, I'm going to be like 23 and a half. I'm going to be so old. I can't wait. So I went to an interview at Fox News, and they literally hired me on the spot to work as the overnight desk assistant, which there is nothing lower on the totem pole than Fox News overnight desk assistant, okay? I mean, it is just the bottom of the barrel. And it was very intense. I would go into work at midnight, finish at 9 a.m. The highlight of our shift was like ordering cheese fries from the diner. But what it allowed me to do, I had no life. I mean, zero life. And you're sitting there and you're like, wow, I'm once again so far away from my dream and so far away from what excites me and is this all a terrible mistake. But one thing that it enabled me to do, because I was on the overnight shift, I used to talk to the Baghdad Bureau when they would wake up in the morning because Baghdad was eight hours ahead of New York. And so I got to live vicariously 
through their experience of the invasion of Iraq, the occupation of Iraq, those first couple of years. And then eventually Fox News was also the only place crazy enough to say, okay, you're 25 and you've never been to a war zone, but sure, we'll send you to Baghdad. And then once I went to Baghdad, I quit Fox News and I set up as a freelancer living in Beirut and, and covering the region from there. So do you think it is that engagement with the Baghdad Bureau that cemented in your mind that you wanted to be a foreign affairs uh, reporter rather than domestic or...? Oh, yeah, I always knew I wanted to do international. I've never been someone who's interested in pursuing a career in political coverage. Actually, at one stage in my career, a few years ago, someone asked me if I would like to be on the campaign trail with Hillary Clinton, which, you know, is a great job for any reporter, tremendously exciting and interesting. I knew immediately that for me the answer was no. There are so many people who are great journalists who cover politics. It just doesn't speak to me in the way that, that this kind of work does. I would say that talking to the Baghdad Bureau was the thing that got me excited and then I would leave work at nine in the morning and I would go and do these Arabic lessons with a remarkable woman from Yemen called Nadia who actually taught me more uh, in many ways uh, about the Arab world than, than anything I had learned in school or in my, uh, in my work. But it was my first trip to Baghdad when I was 25 years old that literally, well not literally, metaphorically blew my mind. And, um, <laughs> sorry. And it was just this experience of being in a place where every moment of every day, every pore of your being is absorbing new stimulus and learning, 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 learning all the time, which was so thrilling and so fascinating and also hugely illuminating. Um, I was a well-traveled person beforehand. I'd like to think I knew a little bit about the world, but there is nothing that you can read about war or watch about war that really prepares you for the actual experience of, of being in a conflict arena. So the first years before you went out to um, um, Baghdad, you helped, you worked on the coverage of the capture and execution of Saddam Hussein, as I mentioned in my introduction, but also the Indian Ocean tsunami um, and the deaths of Arafat and uh, Pope John Paul II. Was this somewhat of a baptism of fire to have sort of one year it, in? It was a little bit in the sense that, you know, first of all, Fox News is not a place that gave you extensive training. It was like, do you have a pulse? Yes. Do you have a social security number? Yes. You're good to go. All right. Um, and so um, there was a sense of being a little bit thrown to the wolves, especially when you're doing the overnight shift because no one else wants to work the overnight shift. And this is how old I am. So when something really big would happen, all the bosses had beepers. I'm like embarrassed. Do you guys know what beepers are? Okay, pagers, yeah, okay. So you would have to like beep them uh, to tell them, you know, Saddam Hussein has been found, like cold desk, you know, and, um, and then they would, you know, try to glean just how badly you'd screwed up in the first hour that you had been left to your own devices in terms of trying to orchestrate the coverage yourself. I, I always knew that desk work wasn't for me for a number of reasons, but it is a hugely important part of your education as a journalist to really understand how the sausage is made. Because what we do in the field on the ground is really just one part of that production line. And there is a huge amount of resources and knowledge and expertise that goes into essentially the business of disseminating information. So you get your first report, how do you verify it? How many sources do you need before you can put it on television? How do you go about getting those people to verify it? How do you then disseminate it to the reporters and teams in the field who either need to get on a plane and go to it or are in place already to respond to it? How do they then get on television and do that? You have to organize satellite trucks back in the day, less so now, but there's a lot of technology and logistics. And so it's a very instructive way of really learning how the entire process works. And it's also something that can translate. You don't need to work in television. Even if you don't want to, you decide that you're more interested in working in the New York Times or wherever. Working in a newsroom is working in a newsroom. And so you're learning like really the fundamentals of, of journalism and, and what it means to, 
take in information, vet it, and then try to disseminate it. How did that differ from your experience the first time as a, as a field reporter? What did you have to learn when you're placed in the field? Well, I mean, it's the same sort of idea in the sense that, like, no one really writes a manual for you on any of this stuff. So you find yourself in very intense situations. And my way of coping with that was to, and I would encourage all of you who are interested in journalism to do the same, is, or any career, frankly, but you find mentors. So you find people who have real knowledge and expertise in a field that you are interested in pursuing, and you ask to shadow them, you spend time with them, you ask them questions, you observe them. And that's really the best way to learn. There's never gonna be a production manual that's gonna say, okay, what do you do when it's a suicide bombing? All right, oh, that's page 63, okay, this is what we do. It doesn't work like that. You also have to be humble in the sense of understanding like you will get things wrong. You will make mistakes. I said things on television early on in my career as a reporter, which I'm like, thank you God that Twitter was not yet a thing. Because, I mean, just, it, it, it'll happen. You're gonna go blank on television and, and just stand there stammering like an idiot for 30 seconds, like wishing that the floor would swallow you up and it won't, you just have to power through it. And I think that having that like inbuilt humility and understanding that contrary to what you've probably been told every day here, that the world's your oyster, it's like the world does not care about you. <laughs> um, and that's okay because you can make it care about you and you can be involved, but you do have to kind of measure your expectations and understand that when you're starting out, it doesn't matter how smart you are, it doesn't matter if you got a double first in PPE or whatever it might be, I'm definitely not getting a double first uh, in PPE. <laughs> you're going to have to work really hard and you're going to start from the bottom and you're going to have to learn a lot. And I'm still learning to this day and I've been doing this now for over 20 years. So um, yeah, finding, finding people who do this work that you really respect and that you can learn from is a hugely important trope. So obviously you first witnessed conflict when you were sent to the Middle East in 2006 and then when you were in Russia in 2008 you were present for the Russian invasion of, of Georgia. Mm. Um, how did these initial experiences of being in conflict affect you? What were the things that surprised you most and you found most difficult about being a reporter? In so I think there's a few things. Um, one of the first things that you realise quickly is everybody feels fear in a war zone and there's a sort of myth about the swashbuckling war correspondent that you don't feel fear and that you're a daredevil and that you're addicted to the adrenaline but actually my experience with most of us has been that you really do feel fear and fear has a huge importance evolutionarily it's a good thing to feel fear it instructs you to get out of dangerous situations it's really about how you respond to fear and how you deal with fear. And some people are prone to really panicking in a situation where they're fearful. That can be very dangerous in a conflict zone. Other people, like myself, tend to get very quiet um, when they're afraid, which is actually more of an attribute in a war zone because you can work with that. You can, you can channel that into um, being calm and cool and collected and, and getting done what you need to get done. So I think I quickly realized that even though I was very afraid, particularly going into Iraq, which at the time I went into Iraq in 2005, it really was, even the drive from the airport was considered to be one of the most dangerous roads in the world. It was incredibly dangerous. And Western journalists and Westerners of, of, of all walks of life were being actively targeted um, by the insurgency. And even if you went out with US soldiers, you were being targeted also um, by IEDs, improvised explosive devices. So it was incredibly dangerous and I was very afraid, but I also understood that I was able to deal with the fear. And so that's, I think, the first inkling that you have that like, maybe I can be good at this because even though it frightens me, it also excites me and it interests me and I'm able to more or less contain my fear. The other thing that usually happens early on in a war correspondent's career is that inevitably you will have a near-death situation at some point, which is a very important moment in your career, 
because it is also easy, as much as you have felt fearful, to get a little bit cavalier when you're in a war zone and you haven't yet had that experience and you haven't lost anyone in a war and it still all feels a little bit abstract and glamorous and kind of exciting and you feel like you're play acting and you're bulletproof vest and it's uh, so my second trip to Iraq um, in 2005 and uh, there was a triple suicide car bombing attack on the hotel that I was in and I re remember very vividly f thinking that we were going to die and I also remember that in that moment, you do have a series of epiphanies. First of all, the profound realization that you can die doing this work, that it's not a game, it's not a joke, it's not a, a, a charade or a sort of act that you can put on and then take off. Like, it's real, it's hell, and you can die doing it. And, and, and I do think that's an important moment because some people have that experience and then they're like, okay, this is totally not for me. This is insane. Why would I ever do this? And then other people have it uh, as I have, you know, on a number of occasions. And for me, it's always been very humbling, that moment, because it reminds you that you are not invincible, no matter how brave you are, no matter how young you are, no matter how smart you are. You are not invincible and you need to be humble um, in the face of what you're experiencing. And I would also just add that it gives you more of a sense of compassion about the lives of the people who you're covering. Because at the end of the day, that is what this work is about. It's not about you, it's not about your ego, it's not about your accolades. It is about doing justice to the stories of people, most often ordinary civilians, who are caught up in conflicts and giving them a voice and allowing them to get their side of the story on the record, and holding the people who are responsible for their welfare accountable for their actions. So for that reason, I would say that covering those early conflicts gave me a little bit of a sense of humility and a reminder of what the core mission really is with this work. And then the other thing that I would mention is that it also gives you a, a real sense of, because it's easy to forget this, we talk so much about the journalism and the importance of it, but there's a huge logistical component to what we do as well. And so how can I source food in this place? How can I, uh, I need a generator, I need diesel to power the generator, I need to know where we're gonna sleep tonight, I need to know what cars we have, what translators we have, what drivers we have, I mean, enormous amount of planning resources goes into ensuring that a trip is successful. So it's a, a lot and it can be very overwhelming, but I think once you get through those first few trips and, and have a better sense of that, then you have a better, a really, a, a deeper understanding of what it is that you're really embarking on. One more uh, sort of general journalism question for me before we move on to talking about some of civic conflicts that you've mm. reported on. What degree of agency do you get when you are in a conflict zone? So I watched a report a couple of days ago from a journalist in Kharkiv mm -hmm. um, who was just going out with a, um, a, a patrol of Ukrainian soldiers very close to the Russian border. They were shot at, it was just him and his cameraman and this sort of team of soldiers. Mm. To what degree is that decided by the reporter and the cameraman themselves or is sort of controlled higher up by a producer or by the yeah. media outlet? So for the most part, once you're on the ground, it will be controlled by the team on the ground. You mean, you're on the ground, you are the one with eyes and ears and seeing the reality of what's happening. There is a lot now, and particularly in the sort of post-Iraq world, of security consultants who most of the big networks now will have someone assigned to them who is probably former military. Um, and depending on what conflict you're covering, that can be a huge asset, as it is in Ukraine. Um, I've been like amazed by some of the people we've worked with, and they've really helped understand like the specifics of the weaponry and. Um, in other conflicts, it can be trickier. Iraq, Afghanistan don't necessarily want like a huge British guy with like tattoos all over him with his, you know, S, uh, S looking sort of Oakley sunglasses. Um, so 
there are hurdles that you have to get through before you can get approval to go and do a story that is dangerous, at least at CNN. So we will have to submit something, which is a proposal on paper. And we just did this. We were also recently in Kharkiv. So we're in Kharkiv. We want to go out with the ambulance workers. Um, this is the area we want to go to. These are the threats in this area. This is the window of time when we're going to be there. This is the plan for check-ins. It's, it's a pretty exhaustive list, and sometimes it can feel onerous, but it's hugely important because what it does is it just sharpens your awareness and sharpens your planning. And a big part of why things can often go wrong in war zones is because you don't have a good plan in place. Everybody understands that once you start the mission, things can go wrong, things can change, you make decisions on the fly, and that is almost always dictated by the team on the ground. So it's not that the plan is like, oh, no, we can't do this because he's driving a Toyota Corolla and the risk assessment said it was going to be a, a Land Cruiser. No. I, I, you know, you, 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 you improvise as you go. And I do think that that's been a shift. Um, I think that earlier on, if you talk to people who covered Yugoslavia, for example, uh, there was much less of that oversight and much more free reign on the ground. But because of the evolution of the technology and also, you know, how many journalists have been, have been killed, um, I think that there, there is heightened security uh, concerns. And, and, and for the most part, it's a really good thing that forces us to be a little more focused and um, a little more assiduous in our planning. Um, speaking again of, of Hakiv, um, you were one of the very first journalists on the ground yeah. following the invasion. Were, I'm not going to ask you were you expecting the invasion because I definitely no was not. But was there a sort of sense from in CNN and other news outlets that there may be conflict in Ukraine in the next few months? Let's have plans ready to get journalists out there. So what happened was it started in about November or December, and we started to hear rumblings, and they were coming from the U.S. from the intelligence community that there's this large massing of Russian troops at the border with Ukraine, we think there's going to be um, an invasion. And we were like, what are you talking about? Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. And then there were more troops, and then there were more troops. And so then in January, a lot of us had to go. And we went to Ukraine. We talked to the Ukrainian leadership. They did not believe there was going to be an invasion. Or rather, I should say publicly, they would not <coughs> say that there was going to be an invasion. The Russians continued to say that there was not going to be an invasion, although obviously you'd take that with a grain of salt. And so I think that for most of us, we believed at that stage, and there were many of us who you know, have spent a lot of time in Russia, have covered Russia, have lived there, have you know, covered Russian wars before, covered the annexation of Crimea, and almost all of us felt that it was inconceivable that Russia would invade Ukraine. Most, pro most prominently because it did not make any sense. There was no clear victory for President Putin to achieve. And even at that stage, with a, a much different understanding of what the battle would look like and how quickly Ukraine would probably be forced to capitulate, uh, it still didn't seem to make any sense. So, but nonetheless, President Biden then was starting to say it. It's happening, it's imminent, it's imminent. We would hear this word imminent day in and day out. And we were sort of scratching our heads, like what's going on here? Because is this a strategy? Maybe that the Americans think that by holding Russia's feet to the fire and talking constantly about how an invasion is imminent, that they're hoping to avert a possible invasion. Like maybe this is part of the tactic. And, then President Putin gave a speech about three days before the actual invasion where he, he recognized the Donbass region uh, as being independent at the very end. But the first 53 minutes of the speech was basically a diatribe about how Ukraine is not a sovereign nation and doesn't really have any claim to be anything other than a kind of extension of Russia. And as I listened to that speech, I understood fully that there was going to be an invasion. And I think all of us did in that moment. Because we had believed that war was the bluff in order to push for diplomatic gains. 
And in that moment, I understood that diplomacy was the bluff and that war was always the plan to push for those gains. So we then drove to Kharkiv. We were in Kiev at the time. We drove to Kharkiv and we got a call as we were driving there from our, uh, our stateside offices basically being like completely off the record. It's gonna start tonight. It's gonna start around four in the morning. And you get that feeling in your stomach, you know, when you do this of like, it's a little bit of dread and a little bit of nerves, like getting ready. You've got like a lot to do to be ready for this moment. And you know it's gonna be a big moment, but you really don't know what it's gonna look like and what it's gonna feel like. And so we arrived in Kharkiv, we did our live shots. And then at five in the morning, I wanna say Moscow time, President Putin started speaking. It was an, a sort of unplanned uh, speech. And it was like two days after the one he had just given and everyone scrambled to get onto this balcony at this hotel and literally he finished the speech and you just heard like <laughs> like all across the night sky just massive bombardment happening and then in that moment you you know that you're witnessing history you know that you can't really fully get your arms around um, everything that's happening, but you also know that your only job in that moment is to be on air and just talking about what you're seeing. Don't try to understand everything that's happening. Don't try to have the clever answers. Don't even worry about the pithy analysis. In that moment, you're describing what you're seeing. And we went live for seven hours nonstop, went to sleep for three hours, and then we got up and drove around and there was quite a bit of bombardment and I saw a bunch of people standing outside a metro station. And so we, we went and walked down and there were just hundreds of people, hundreds of people who with their pets, with their children, with just whatever snacks they could grab, a couple of plastic bags with their belongings. And it was an extraordinary moment because there was nothing except palpable shock because the people of Ukraine had not been prepared for their government psychologically for the fact that there was going to be an invasion. Shock, disbelief, and really naked fear. And that has quite quickly in Ukraine been replaced by extraordinary resilience and solidarity and tenacity and courage. But in that first day, absolute shock and absolute horror and fear and, and a very real understanding that their lives had changed fundamentally forever and no one yet really knew how. What was the initial reaction from Ukrainian civilians to Western reporters and how did that change over the coming weeks and months? What's been extraordinary to see is that the Ukrainians are incredibly savvy about the power of the media and, and, and the power of messaging. And, and they really have been from the get-go. So they have been incredibly welcoming to Western journalists and also have a very good eye for the kinds of stories that will, um, that will get shared widely and that will get a lot of traction. And you only need to look at President Zelensky, right? And how he, no one knew at all how he would step into this moment, right? I mean, he was a comedian, he was later on a politician, but he didn't necessarily have that breadth and depth of experience that made it clear that this was a man who was made for this moment. But you only needed to watch the first few of those selfie videos from his office, from his bunker, with his cabinet out on the streets of Kyiv to understand that he was absolutely made for this moment and was kind of assuming a Churchillian mantle, but doing so in the context of a very social media savvy 21st century um, leader of a liberal democracy. And so that has absolutely informed, I would say, the way the military has um, embraced journalists, the way uh, sort of writ large volunteer forces have been largely accommodating of Western journalists. War is war, and so you are always going to face 
push back when you're trying to get to a front line. No, you can't go, it's too dangerous. When you're trying to shoot some video of this, this, or that. No, you can't do that. That's giving away a, a state secret or whatever it might be. So there, there are always going to be tensions between journalists covering war and, and the sort of hosts. Uh, uh, I'll give you another example. When we were in Kharkiv, we accidentally ended up in a military hospital and we, we hadn't known. We were with these ambulance workers. We came under very heavy bombardment and they took this man who was severely injured and we were in, one of my cameramen was in the ambulance and we were following and we just, we just drove into this hospital. And only when we arrived did we realize it's a military hospital. Military hospitals have very, very, very strict protocols about filming there. It's not allowed. So, you know, we got detained for like two or three hours and they wanted to see everything on our camera. And, and that's a situation where you're kind of petrified because it was a genuine accident. You're not interested. I wasn't even interested in showing the hospital, but you're very nervous about losing your footage that you just shot, especially in our case, because it, it was a very dramatic and intense scene. It all was resolved in the end, but this is another thing about covering war in general you have to be patient and you have to understand that while you're on deadline and you're just like, I want to do this, I want to do that. The people, you know, depending on where you're covering war, but if you're covering war in someone else's country, like understand that their country is at war and their priority is not for you to make your deadline. So it's just important to like keep that spirit of humility a little bit and be patient and realize that like you are going to encounter resistance and restrictions sometimes. Um, a couple of more questions for me before I open up to audience questions. Um, one more about Russia and Ukraine. Having reported on Russia on the ground since at least 2008, how have, you, have you found that it's changed the manner in which you report about the Russian people? And has that been upsetting and sort of surprising? I would say that the thing that's changed has been, you know, I moved to Moscow in 2007 and I was there as an intern <coughs> in 2003 for granted just a few months, but it gave you a sense of like the lay of the land and how things were done. And you used to have a lot more access in Russia and working for CNN was not something that was, you know, going to be greeted by a sneer, let's say, from someone. and. And we would tell all different kinds of stories, right? That these weren't only stories about, I don't know, a Russian aggression in Georgia, for example, or you're telling stories as well about any number of things, feature stories that it really ran the gamut. And then I would say after the annexation of Crimea and Russia's intervention in Syria, the relationship with for Western journalists working in Russia became more strained, more challenging, less access, um, more anti-Western media propaganda. Um, I then, on a personal level, was involved with two big investigations, one into the use of mercenaries in the Central African Republic, and um, one into the poisoning of Alexei Navalny, which culminated in me knocking on the door of an FSB agent who was part of the team that tried to poison him. And after that, I was no longer able to get Russian visas at all, which for me is actually sad because I've spent so much of my career in Russia and I do feel a deep attachment to Russia and I have many Russian friends and I think that it's really important in a moment like this, even if you fundamentally disagree with everything that Russia has done, it is still really important to keep telling that story. It is still really important to have that channel of communication open. It is still really important to be talking to ordinary Russians and getting a sense of how they see their government's actions and if they do support it, why do they support it? And because what happens if you don't have that level of exposure and access, you rely too much on kind of official statements and, you know, official statements serve a purpose, right? But they, they, there is so much that they don't capture about the zeitgeist or what the sort of unsaid feeling is of what's going on or ways in which and economy or people are hurting as a result of certain actions. And so it's really fundamentally important to have people on the ground. 
we still have, when my, my colleague was just in Moscow for a couple of weeks, it is very difficult to report from there now because of the new laws that have been put into place about misinformation. So if you, you cannot say that it is a war in Russia, you can only call it a special military operation. You um, can be sent to imprison for many years for disseminating what they call fake news. Well, what constitutes fake news? This is basically a, a, a sort of blanket that allows them to target journalists, not just Western journalists, actually probably primarily Russian journalists, um, but it creates a very difficult and dangerous dynamic for international reporters who are working there. And um, I, I really do think that's a shame. One last question for me, then I promise I'll let you ask your questions, which is that you mentioned the Central African Republic. Um, we haven't had time to talk about it, but um, you obviously reported on Aleppo and then reported on that to the Security Council. What's the most challenging part of the world or conflict you've ever reported from and what made it more challenging than the others? I mean, all of them are really hard. Uh, I would say, look, Syria was probably the most challenging and most dangerous conflict I've ever covered. Um, in part because I continued to cover it after it was really not safe any longer for Western journalists to go. So, um, you know, a good friend of mine was captured by the regime, Austin Tice. Several friends of mine were captured and ultimately killed by ISIS. And the whole thing became so chaotic and so dangerous that journalists basically stopped going for very good reason. And when I went to Aleppo, which was the, the trip that precipitated the invitation to speak at the UN Security Council, we were some of the first Western journalists really to have gone in in, um, in a long time. And we had to go in undercover and we had to work with local people on the ground. And um, it was very, very challenging because the security is such a major concern. It's, there, there was no safe place in Syria, not from the sort of Islamist militia, which at that stage were actively kidnapping Westerners, and even more uh, pronounced the risk of the aerial bombardment, which was completely unpredictable, which was daily, um, relentless. My first day there on that trip, we saw a fruit market get bombed. No reason, it was like selling oranges and just fruit. 10 year old boy was killed, two women were killed, a handful of other people were also killed. And so trying to operate in that environment and you don't have the sort of traditional things that you're used, like normally in war, we don't stay right on the front lines. We stay a little ways back. We might stay in a hotel. We, we probably would have Wi-Fi. We tend to stay together a lot, journalists, because there's a sort of safety in numbers idea. You'd have your security consultant. In uh, Ukraine, for example, we have a, an armored car because a number of journalists have been killed um, coming under small arms fire. And so in Syria, you had none of that. It was me and one other girl, my producer at the time, who's a reporter now, Selma Abdulaziz, and wearing an abaya and a niqab, and basically embedding with uh, a, a journalist who was working there. And so you do feel, in, in, in some ways, being undercover is a better security than having a really high profile with all the trappings that that comes from. Certainly it was the right call for that um, conflict zone but tremendously challenging. You don't have comms in the same way, like your phones don't work in the same way, you don't have Wi-Fi in the same way. And so very, very difficult and, and, and definitely very dangerous, although I would still argue, I felt like very proud of that story. I felt like it was hugely important because so few people had been able to document the aftermath of Russia's intervention in the war and particularly from the skies. Um, thank you very much. I did promise I'd open up to the audience. So if you have any questions uh, for uh, Clarissa, please, can you raise your membership cards in the air? Uh, or just your hands? Uh, yes, I want to remember in the front row. Um, I would really like to ask about... Oh, what well, can you wait for the microphone? Sorry. Oh, cool. <laughs> so. um, okay, so I can't really ask for all, the, for all the conflict zones that you've been into because that would take quite a long time for you to answer the question. So I think let's narrow down on like just Ukraine. What would be the most significant story that you think you shot and like, you know, reported, but you didn't actually make the cut 
So like the kind of most important story that you have discovered but not reported on for the media, you know, here. Okay, well, I am at a stage in my career now where if I report and do a story and it doesn't make the cut, something's gone really terribly wrong. Um, so I would hope that like every story I would uh, report on would make it. It wasn't always that way. I worked at ABC News, um, which is a tremendous news organization, but I did a trip to Afghanistan to Helmand province, and um, I did a story on poppy season and the opium trade and how US Marines were trying to combat it. And I did another story on how one of the biggest issues facing the US military occupation, among many in Afghanistan, was the fact that they had no access to women, right? Because these were predominantly male soldiers, Marines, who um, in a much more conservative society, and particularly in the south of Afghanistan, they, you, they're not even allowed into the women's part of the, of the houses. So I did a story on this trial project they did called um, FETs. They were female engagement teams, is what they were called, where they had female soldiers and Marines who would go and were specifically designated to uh, be interlocutors with women. Those stories never made air. They never got on the air. Um, which was a real blow for me. And it's a very different dynamic at network because you only have two shows, one in the morning, one in the evening. The one in the evening is half an hour long and nine of those minutes are commercials. So it's, it is really challenging to get your pieces on air. But it was also, I think, a really important education in the sense that like, you learn that like, taking risk is not enough. You have to tell a really compelling story, right? And you have to shape a narrative that is clear and compelling and, and relevant. And um, I mean, I'd like to think I did that. But at the same time, uh, it happened to lots of people. It wasn't just me. When you were a sort of younger reporter at that stage, it didn't really matter where you went. You had to fight to get your pieces on air. Now I think I'm attuned enough to the news cycle and experienced enough. And I work for a place that has 24 hours a day to fill. Um, which means that if I decide that a story is interesting and, and we work hard on it, I, it, it, will, it will get on TV. But what I would say, uh, you know, just like thinking about your question in a different sense, is like you also learn, or one also learns when you do this for a while, oh, I'm not even going to pitch that because that's probably not going to be as interesting or not going to be necessarily as relevant or... And so, in a sense, you kind of, you learn what you think they will be interested in. And when I say they, I'm not just talking about the network, I'm really talking about like the audience, that sort of amorphous beast. Um, so, it's, it's a little bit of quid pro quo. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next question, please. Can we have the, the member in the front row? Uh, second row, sorry. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm curious how you keep your uh, mental uh, sane. How I stay sane? Yeah, how it's you stay question. sane. <laughs> how you sleep at night and what are your yeah. tricks? Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. So I think the best trick I learned was, you know, there's a real tendency when you do this work and you come back from a place like Aleppo to really struggle to um, embrace joy and embrace love and people who love you and things that make you happy and laughter. And you have a natural tendency to, first of all, self-flagellate because you feel guilt. Why do I get to leave and some people don't and I should be back and I could have done more and I didn't give enough and when am I going back and nobody here understands me and you feel sort of detached um, to a certain degree from your real life. That's a very dangerous place. It's a natural place to go to uh, when you cover conflict, but it's also a dangerous place to go to. And it's very important that you learn how to reintegrate into your normal life and you find mechanisms to do that. So whether that is doing yoga, praying, um, going out and getting hammered, although I wouldn't recommend that. Um, it's, I mean, just in the long run, that's going to come back to bite you in the ass in a different way. Um, 
you find the things that give you joy and that make you happy and you learn to open your heart to them and to accept them. And for me, I made a deal in my mind, I guess, that like, okay, the randomness of privilege is so grotesque and unfair and I can never explain that and I can never understand that. But cutting myself off from that privilege doesn't make me a better journalist. It actually makes me a worse journalist because it means that I burn out and then I don't have the energy to go back and do it all over again. So I understand now that like I need to fill the tank. I need to replenish and I need to nourish myself in order to be strong enough to go back and, and, and tell those stories again or travel to different places and tell those stories. And once you understand that and, and really believe it, and then I do think it starts to become easier. The other thing you have to understand and accept is when you're going at 100 miles per hour and you're not sleeping and there's a lot of adrenaline, you're probably not eating well and you might be like, you know, vaping or whatever it is that like helps you stay awake, um, you're going to crash. So the, you have a tendency always, especially when you're like early on in your career to think, I can't wait to go home and these are all the things I'm going to do and I'm going to go out to this dinner and have this meal and go to the theater. And then you get home and like you don't want to feel like doing any of that because the minute you start to let go of that tension, you hit the deck. And so you have to like bargain in a week of like, I'm probably not going to leave the house very much. I'm going to watch a lot of really bad TV and that's okay. <laughs> and um, and I'm just going to be good to myself. I'm going to treat it like I'm sick and I need to get better. And I don't need to be so hard on myself all the time. So those are some of the tactics. And then the other thing that's really important, and I tell everybody who does this job this, and it's still a bit of a taboo in this industry, which is ludicrous. It's like, obviously, anyone who is doing this job and bearing witness to trauma or bearing witness to other people's trauma needs to have some kind of an outlet, whether that's therapy or whatever, where they are trying to process and unpack that. Because it sits in the body somewhere. You don't get to just do this job for 20 years and see these things and not pay a price for this. And I tell young journalists all the time, I'm like, the check is coming, sorry, the bill is coming, right? And like, you will get it. So be smart and start like making some down payments now so that, you, <laughs> so that you're ready for it. And um, yeah, those are just a few things. <laughs> Thank you. Um, anyone else wants to ask a question? Um, the, the gentleman in the pink shirt over here. White shirt, pink shirt, can't tell. Uh, thank you very much. Um, from your contacts in Russia, how do you feel the Russian public are uh, accepting the Russian media over there? Do you think they are swayed by Putin's propaganda rhetoric? Um, and do you feel they have, or do you feel that they have access to Western media and their influences are being changed. And do you think at any stage in the future we can see some form of coup or public uprising, mm -hmm. which I think is already passed from my own opinion. Mm. Um, so I think probably my former question is yeah. more important. So I think we have a tendency sometimes in the West to wear rose tinted glasses where this is concerned and be like, obviously everyone in Russia must be just horrified, right? Like what a disaster this is, it's going so badly and the sanctions are so punishing and NATO's gonna take on Finland and Sweden and McDonald's is leaving Russia and, and you, know, you know things are bad when McDonald's is leaving. So actually in Russia, I think that the propaganda campaign has been remarkably effective. It's important to remember that the vast majority of Russians get their uh, information from state media, which is basically just propaganda day in and day out. And any outlet um, that used to kind of, um, not even be like an opposition outlet, but at least a bit more nuanced, a bit more liberal, a bit more critical, has effectively been shut down or has been forced to shut itself down in the face of this new legislation. Now, Russians do still have access, like the, it, Russia and Ukraine, almost all the real stuff is happening on Telegram, which is a, a messaging app. And there are like dozens of Telegram channels. 
And so if you are a savvy young Russian who is educated and living in an urban center and you have traveled outside of the country, you are probably on a few of these telegram chats and you are um, seeing the discourse from a different side, but you're also in a minority. The vast majority of Russians do not live in urban centers, have not left the country, have not probably traveled more than four or 500 miles from their hometowns. And so the majority of people from what I have seen and heard still support this war. They do not understand what is actually going on. They genuinely believe this is a special military operation to save Ukraine from Nazis, from neo-Nazis. Um, and so, you know, the language around it is very crude and very blunt, um, but the messaging is, is, is quite powerful. One caveat there, which I have just been tracking in like the last couple of weeks, and particularly yesterday, something interesting happened. Some former colonel military analyst on a state TV, they have this thing where they all like stand like they're in some weird sort of American Idol situation, but they're talking about the news, um, gave a six minute diatribe about basically why the war is a disaster. And you're watching this and you're like, does this guy know that he's gonna get killed? Like, I mean, I'm, I'm being facetious, okay. But it, it was kind of an extraordinary thing to do and you don't hear traditionally those voices of dissent um, on uh, Russian state media and unless they're sanctioned on some level. Now, the host, this woman, uh, was sort of doing her part to like fight back against what he was saying and, and, and sort of try to denigrate his argument. So I was left with, I was, I couldn't decide whether the whole thing was staged. Like, let's just float this idea. And if it is staged and they're floating this idea, who's supposed to take the blame for this, right? And who's floating this idea? Um, or whether it was just a really candid moment from a very brave guy who like, you know, wouldn't have been killed for something like that. I was being glib before, but could certainly face some difficult times for saying something like that. Then there was another, uh, you know, a few pro Kremlin bloggers who also have telegram channels who were talking about how there are elements of the war that are, are basically a bit of a disaster. Um, not questioning the reasoning for invading Ukraine. No one's talking about that and no one is trying to argue about that. But talking about the very real challenges that the Russian military has been facing on the battlefield and the very real challenges that Russia is now facing on the international stage as something of a pariah. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. I don't yet know what it portends. I have talked to a few people um, in the sort of intelligence world who have thought that maybe there could be some kind of a someone in Putin's inner circle, uh, one of the so-called Siloviki, would step up and say, this is, you know, Putin needs to go to a sanatorium now and, you know, take some time to get over whatever illness he may or may not have. But then I have also been assured by some Russian sources I have that that is really overly optimistic thinking. So I've been wrong on everything I've predicted in Ukraine. <laughs> so I'm not going to make a prediction, but I will say it's an interesting time. I think we have time for one more quick question. Um, the gentleman over there, the glasses. Um, Mrs. Ward has said that she's happy to stay around in the bar for yeah. 15, 20 minutes afterwards so. if you want to go ask her your questions there and more importantly, buy drinks for the society. Um, thanks for coming and thanks for all of your powerful reporting. Um, Thank you. I'm interested, you've mentioned and alluded to the fact that you work with a lot of people on the ground, drivers or translators or fixers, yep. and you've also alluded to the fact that there's a sense of guilt when you get to leave. And I'm curious about particularly those people you're working with on the ground. Um, what responsibility do you feel for them? Or yeah. what sort of journalistic ethics or moral duty do you, does that sort of situation create? Particularly got to Afghanistan. Yeah, right? no, it's, that's a really important question. Um, and uh, I feel that any member of the team is a member of the team. And it doesn't matter if you're Ukrainian or Afghan or American or British or French, it's, it's, you're a member of the team. So whether that's about who gets to wear body armor, right? Body armor is hugely expensive and it's a real pain to schlep around. 
but you always want to make sure you're carrying enough body armor for everyone in that vehicle to be wearing it. And everyone. And similarly, you want to be making sure that when you're making a decision to go to the front line, that everybody in that vehicle is comfortable with that decision. And if anyone is not, then you turn around. And it's really that simple. And it's not even a case of, you know, altruism. It's also about like your driver knows a lot better than you do what the lay of the land is. And so you should listen to them. And I think that fundamentally, of course, you bear a responsibility for the people who are risking their lives to work with you. Um, not just when you're there, but beyond. Are they facing any threats uh, because of their work for you? Um, I've had situations where I've had to get people out of the country for a while, not in Ukraine, um, but in other situations. In Afghanistan, part of the reason we evacuated when we did, which was you know a little earlier than maybe ideally I would have liked to, but we knew we had to get our, our local producer, Shafi, out. And he didn't have the luxury of like hanging around for a few more days to make sure he really did justice. He needed to get out. And so that was the most important thing. So that's what we did. We got him out and other people who were working in the house where we were staying as well. So that has to be at the forefront of everyone's minds. Um, ethically, you do have a huge responsibility and also, Let's just be sensitive, okay? Because yes, as you said, you, I get to leave. They don't. And sometimes local producers are working with teams back to back for like months on end without getting a break. What kind of PTSD are they going through? What kind of burnout are they going through? Like, look after people, make sure they're doing okay. Check in with them. Um, I always make it a point of even if I'm not working with you know, uh, any one of like, you know, CNN has a lot of local producers in Ukraine. Whenever I see them, sit down, have a coffee. How are you doing? How, how is your family? Be a human being. Because it's not just about, let's get this story on air, let's crush this, let's do this, let's, you know, which is important, right? That is the fundamental mission of what you're trying to do is get these stories out. But never forget that your job transcends what you put on television or put on the, the front page of the paper. Your job is to listen to people's stories and to be open to their experience and to take it all on board. And whether that's interviewing President Zelensky or whether that's having a conversation with your local producer about how his family is doing, in my mind, it's equally important. It's different, but it's equally important. Very quickly for me on that before we have to wrap up, I'm afraid. Um, did you have any friends or former colleagues who got stuck in Afghanistan last summer? I had, no. I actually, I know of many people who did. Um, we were very fortunate. Um, I know of a few women who I have subsequently worked with in Afghanistan uh, or have covered their stories who are desperate to get out and who are not able to get out and I have tried very hard, but the situation is far more complex now. And there are still people who worked with the US military who are unable to get out, and it becomes more and more challenging every day. And I, you know, I think that's a, that's a burden that, that, we, that we all share. A final question that we ask all of our speakers before, uh, at the end of the event. Um, if in two or three sentences you could give a piece of advice to all of our members, not just those present, and indeed to all students at the University of Oxford, what would that piece of advice be? Listen, you're not always the cleverest person in the room. Um, and even if you are, it doesn't matter because you can still learn so much from just listening. And I feel like as a culture, we've lost track of that. Listen, be curious, and be open. Be open to other people's ideas and experiences, even though they might challenge your own. You're, you're strong enough to be open to them. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Mrs. Chris Ward. Thank you. You did a great job.